topic of building young black African-centered warriors. Warriors. Jude Elliott. What's up, man? We got Facebook and Instagram live. Oh, we got at him again. Zeke, what's up, man? Man, you should have been here for this show. This would have been the perfect show for you. But matter of fact, I'm kind of glad you're not here because uh, you might have took it off the deep end. <laughs> I think Zeke was born for war. We should have named him War Boy or something like that. All right. Two things before I get started. Number one. Uh, BPM, Community Empowerment Session. Not this coming Saturday, but the Saturday that's going to follow that. I believe that's going to be the 6th, October the 6th. Uh, get ready for that, uh, all of North Florida. Well, everybody in Florida who wants to come, you, uh, you're you invited because we're trying to get our people together. Not only youth, but our whole our community overall. So let's get ready for that. I will have details as far as the location. Uh, there might be, we're going to be at one or two locations, either our normal location or our alternate. So I'm not going to give you one until I know exactly. But uh, I believe that's going to be, it's the first Saturday in Sept uh, October. Get ready. BPM Community Empowerment Session. Now, the next thing I want to say is this. Over this last week, and I've been looking into this and studying this for quite a while now, but over this last week, I've been slapped in the face with how aggressive, domineering, relentless, and flat out vicious the movement is to destroy the black family. Well, what movement is that? In the beginning, well, not in the beginning, but in former years, we thought the main aim, the main Enemies of the black family structure were the war on drugs, racist police, prison industrial complex, uh, terrible education system, things that destroyed our youth, destroyed our boys, uh, took our men out of the household. And those things do, right? Those things do destroy black families and make it harder for us to live in strong families. And as a criminal defense attorney, I can tell you, those things do, right? The harsh unnecessary sentences that a lot of our men get, the fact that they're they're targeted, those things do uh, make it hard and sometimes impossible. It's impossible to be a husband if you get choked to death for allegedly selling loose cigarettes, right? <laughs> How you gonna be a good husband if you get shot dead uh, because an officer asks you for your ID and you reach for it and he blows you away? How you gonna raise kids when you've been blown away off the face of the earth like John Crawford III in Walmart, a white supremacist called the police on him, said that he was walking around waving a gun when really he was in the Walmart purchasing a BB gun. The police show up and kill him and the white supremacist gets no uh, type of penalty. How you gonna be a good father when you got blowed away in Walmart for having a BB gun? Right, those were the previous things that d destroyed the black family. But now it's even worse because now the en our enemies are so tricky and so conniving that they're not only going to destroy the black family, they're going to their aim is to destroy the idea of the black family. Check me out now. They're trying to destroy the whole notion, the whole concept of a real African family, the masculine feminine balance the key to life, right? They going after it hard. They going after it hard. They don't want you to believe in a black woman being in a black man, being with a black man, working together, building a family, raising kids, building a financial foundation, passing the coast. They don't want you to believe in that. They don't even want you to believe in that, let alone achieve it, right? It's been a long time where a lot of us find it hard to achieve, but at least we believed in it and we knew that was the goal, they don't even want us to look at that as the goal. They want us to believe that there's no such thing as the nuclear family. The, the traditional family is just an illusion. And what families are is they're just a group of people who love each other. And no, it doesn't need to be a husband and a wife. 
And no, you know, we could have, just didn't have to be producing children. And no, you don't have to believe one way or the other. Right? This is the bullshit that they're coming after us with, and they're getting aggressive. I read an article the uh, last night from a black man, and I'm pretty sure he was gender confused and fluid. And the name of the article was, The Black Man is the White Man of the Black Community. I said, what? The name of the article was, The, heter no, no, the Heterosexual Black Man is the White Man of the Black Community. Now, if it sounds stupid, then hell yeah, it sounds stupid. But this is serious now. This is what's going on on the Black Lives Matter feminist fluidity circuit. The heterosexual. Okay, so that means the homosexual black man is not a part of this. Okay, the heterosexual black man is the white man in the black community. I said, what bastard wrote this? And you know how something can be so demented that you have to read it just to be able to destroy it? The point of this article was that the heterosexual black man was just as oppressive, privileged, and and domineering over black women as the white man. I said, oh, shit. Hey, see, this is the problem. When you don't know history, the, the people in this fluidity movement don't really know history. Let me ask you a question. If we had women like Yaa Asantewa, Queen Candace, and Empress Nzinga in Africa, right, that could probably kill most of the men in their own communities, how in the hell are we going to dominate them and walk all over them, even if we wanted to? But we didn't, but I'm just saying. You see, the black man, no, the black man never treated, the black man never treated our women like the European did. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But the Europeans pillaged, raped, burned, mutilated, degraded their women. They had no power. A European put more uh, value in his livestock than in his women. That's not us. These people keep trying to assign a history and an ideology to us that's not ours. Right? We're going to have to fight like hell against these people. I'm talking about fight spiritually. Uh, intellectually, morally, physically, financially, politically, we're going to have to fight these people because they are sick. I don't know if they're just that ignorant or just that sick. And speaking of sick, I saw a video the other day, and, and it was a fight. It was two black guys, or I thought they were guys. They were about to fight, and they were surrounded by what I thought were four other black guys. I said, this is going to be a fight. And I automatically saw that the people in the video couldn't really fight. I said, this is going to be funny. I watched the video. The other guys were saying, get him, girl. Get him, girl. And I'm like, no, these are guys. But no, these people were really uh, demented enough to believe that they were all women. And they were saying, beat that whole ass. Get a girl. Get I said, wait a minute. What's going on? The, every black male in this video, and they were fighting over another black male, really thought they were females. To the point where they were saying, girl, you better get off me. Girl. I'm like, what the hell? Our people are demented. Not, not all of them, but more and more of them are falling to this sickness. And, and, and this is going to be a part of building these warriors, the things we have to teach them. We got to know what we're up against now. Right? We got, hey, Dessalines 1804. We got to fight on all fronts. You're absolutely right. So I just wanted to get that off my chest before I get into this. And another thing I want to say is you're going to notice. I'm talking about building young black male warriors here. I'm talking about specifically boys, males, men now. But what you're going to notice is how important a woman is in all of this. Because I'm a warrior. I consider myself to be a warrior. Whether we're talking about intellectually, physically, combat, uh, scholarship, I'm ready to fight, right? And we'll get into that more later. But one thing I learned early on in life, the, the moment that I realized fighting was a good thing. See, some of us think fighting is bad. If you think fighting is bad, you're going to always be a slave. Fighting is a good thing. 
right? People want to come out to BPM because we teach our boys to wrestle, box, shoot, jiu-jitsu. Ju we teach them everything. Fighting is good. Now, I'm going to say, if, if you know two things. Number one, you got to know fighting is good. I learned that lesson when I was about three or four. I got an older brother. I don't know. He's about, what, five years older than me, whatever. He was a tough guy, too. So when we were young, I remember one of our favorite things to do was to watch wrestling, the ultimate warrior and all these people. And then once we see them body slam each other and choke, we didn't know it was fake. But we would go make our bed into a wrestling ring and whoever would get thrown off, you lose. So you might hit a wall, you might hit the floor, you might hit your head, right? We thought we were the ultimate warrior Hulk Hogan, Lex Luger, we thought we were these big, strong fighters, right? The, the, the way I found out fighting was good, but it was because of my mom. She would watch us in these battles, and I would almost always lose because I was younger, and my brother knew what the hell he was doing. I was getting thrown off the bed, hitting the wall, crawling back up, and trying to go again, right? But at those moments, because the black woman is the first teacher she's the one in the house with these kids the most you know under under ideal circumstances at that moment when i'm getting thrown off the bed busting my head falling on the ground don't know what to do my mom has two choices she could say stop boys this is too rough someone's gonna get hurt you guys are gonna break something go sit down and cross your legs right that's what she could have said or she could have said what she did say. Get back up, T. Get back in there. You can get him. You can win. <laughs> get off the ground. Stop crying, right? Right? This is what the black woman has the power to do. She could either say, go be a wimp. This is too rough. Or get back up and fight again. Right? And my mom has never, and I mean ever, allowed me to be a wimp or allow 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 any of us to be wimps even my sisters but let alone us she would say get up get she was cheering for me and but what that tell me that taught me a lesson fighting is good a man is supposed to be able to go into combat compete strive lose or win right Yes, yes, the woman has the power. If the woman ain't by raising warriors, there aren't going to be any warriors because it's going to start with the woman. And if the woman ain't behind the warrior, she's going she gonna to poison him into thinking that fighting is wrong. It's, it's, it's all going to start with the woman. Now, we might think the men are going to raise the warriors, but that woman can damage that child or set him up for success before the man even get involved, right? So I'm, I'm going to come back to the woman a hundred times. Now, before we start this conversation about how do we build our boys into young African-centered warriors, we have to ask our question. We have to answer this question. Do we even need warriors? That's the first question. That's the first question. Do we, as black people, need our young males to be warriors? Do we need fighters? Do we need defenders? Do we need protectors? Do we even need that? Because if that's not something we need, then why are we even having this conversation? Right? We could be talking about making our boys to be more doctors or be more uh, hairstylists or be more scholars or be more lawyers. Why the hell are we talking about warriors, soldiers? Is that something we even need? That's the number one question. Right? Well... It's not a yes or no question. It's not an easy question. Do we need warriors? It depends. What does it depend on? It's two points of view on this, right? And there's two points of view in all of black African-American history. Because we didn't have this question in Africa. Well, I guess we kind of did. Because there were integrationists there too. Right? This question comes down to two things. If you believe that black people ought to be politically and economically independent, self-sufficient, sovereign, and building for ourselves, then we must have warriors, right? We have to have soldiers. 
if you believe that we ought to be independent, if you don't want to be uh, dependent upon larger American society, if you don't want to be intermingled and intertangled as a part of that society, if you want to be able to stand, want us to be able to stand on our own and have our own as a people, then we got to have warriors, right? If you recognize that all of American capitalism and politics is a competition and a war, then we got to have warriors, right? If you recognize that all these people are teaching their kids to accumulate and dominate, then we got to have warriors. But if you're stupid enough to believe that we can be successfully integrated and assimilated into this society and all be equal and all join hands and all be friends, then no, we don't need any warriors because there's no enemy. If America is this welcoming melting pot like they say it is, and one day we're going to all get along if we just get through Trump, we'll all get along and it'll be just, we'll get another Obama and everything is going to be fine as if it was fine under Obama. If you believe in interdependence, if you believe in integration, if you believe in I have a dream, then there's no need for warriors. You see? So that's why I say it's not that easy of a question. Because if you don't want us to be independent, if you're not a nationalist, uh, if you're not a nation, you don't need no warrior. You're just a part of a larger group. The American Army is your warrior. Right? The American Army. <laughs> hey, the American Army will protect you. The police will protect you. The state attorney will protect you. If we're just one part of this, this, this greater nation, right? So it's an easy test. If you fall under, check this out now. The Black Lives Matter. I'm glad that Black Lives Matter came out. They're my favorite group ever. Because they have taught us exactly what we don't need to be. Right? They don't put it all in one place. They don't showed us the opposite of what to do. They done showed us the graveyard. So now instead of going to the graveyard, we can go to eternal life. They done showed us suicide. So instead of choosing death, we can choose life. They're going to come after the young soon. They're gonna, because they already came after the red, black, and green flag. But this is what I like about Black Lives Matter. Everything they tell me to do, I already know to do the opposite. Okay. So every time Black Lives Matter get on the TV, they're going to say, do not, you don't understand the movement. The real leaders of the movement were Bayard Rustin. They want you to follow Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was a, a fluidist, gender confused, weak need um, black man whose main aim was to sleep with as many black boys as he could. And his political ideology was that blacks can't get anywhere without white people's help. Shit. We built civilization without white people's help. Okay. You want me to follow Bayard? You want me to follow James Baldwin? Right? This is a this is another weak need. We can't do anything without the help of the European American. Oh, Lord. Look at this. These are the people they want you to follow. A. Philip Randolph. Who made it his personal duty to do everything he could to destroy Marcus Garvey? These are the people they want you to follow. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, not, Bayard Rustin was never needed. That's a, I don't know if that's what you meant, but that's a lame, but Bayard Rustin was never needed. But I thank them for making this so clear to us that, that we should never follow them. So if you want to go with Bayard, A. Philip Randolph, or James Baldwin, then no, we don't need warriors. Because our white friends in America will take care of us. They're going to give us uh, jobs. They're going to give us justice. They're going to give us equality and equal rights. And there's no need for warriors. Who the hell are you fighting? We're all Americans. USA. Right? But if you fall a little bit more under the line and the lineage of Marcus Garvey. If you fall a little bit more under the line and lineage of Elijah Muhammad. If you fall a little bit more under the lines of the lineage of Robert F. Williams, then you got to have warriors. Because if black people ever plan to build anything for ourselves, 
as we did in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Durham, North Carolina, and Black Wall Streets all across the country. Let's not think Black Wall Street was just in uh, uh, Oklahoma and Tulsa. We were doing this. We were doing this all over the country, right? And that's why they came with this fake civil rights movement, which was nothing but a consumer rights movement to go and knock out all our black businesses and black communities, bring in white businesses to replace them, still leave us at the bottom of the economic ladder. Okay, I'm getting a little bit off topic. But what I'm saying is that it's no need to build anything that you can't protect. Do you see? If you believe in us building our own families, that's where it starts. Our own communities, our own businesses, then you got to have an army. Because they're coming to bring that shit down. <laughs> okay? All right? It's that, that's that simple. If you don't believe in that, then it's over for you. So, number one, I, I, I fall under the Marcus Garvey. I don't fall under the Martin Luther King. Hell, by the time Martin Luther King got ready to die, he didn't even fall under the Martin Luther King. Okay? Gandhi, this whole Gandhi... Um, uh, be nonviolent for a hundred years and maybe you'll be free. Gandhi was a sick individual. I don't fall under Gandhi. I don't fall under Jesse Jackson. I don't fall under Al Sharpton. I don't fall under Black Lives Matter. I don't fall under Barack Obama. I don't fall under any of these idiots. I fall under I Ida B. Wells. <laughs> I swear I fall under Ida B. Wells and Robert F. Williams. All right, so we got to have warriors. If you don't think we do, if you're if you're a uh, if you're a uh, Carlos Cooks, if you're a uh, a Bayard Rustin fan, let's just face it, there's not many Bayard Rustin fans following me or taking part in this conversation besides the one that want to keep an eye on what we're doing. But everything we're doing is constitutional and legal. How about that? Now you take your ass back to Cointel Pro with that one. All right, now. Now that we've established that we have to have warriors, we have to have soldiers. I think everyone would agree with that. I know um, Ebony Bella would because her sons are BPM soldiers. Now that we've established this, let's go to the first step of building this soldier. All right? And this is from my life experiences now and the things that I've done, the things that I've studied. I've been involved in intellectual warfare, uh, throughout college, going to one of the whitest colleges in the nation where they automatically assume you're an idiot and they automatically assume you're a dumb thug as a black male when you walk in and you have to prove yourself over and over again, right? That's intellectual warfare. And walking into a law school that's predominantly white and it's a competitive curve and they all assume that you're going to be one of the students that flunk out and then you go to the top of the class. This is intellectual warfare. Taking the Florida Bar, which is 14 subjects, 12 hours, uh, six hours a day, right? You got to pay $1,000 just to take the test. And if you fail, guess what? You got to take it again. These are intellectual battles that you have to go through, right? Or in physical battles. I'm just talking about the things that I went through. We've all gone through our battles and our wars to become warriors and soldiers. If you haven't gone through any battles and wars and adversity yet, don't worry, it's coming. But physically, I came from a culture where most of the young black males thought that the only way we would make it out is to either play football or sell dope or rob people. And these are very physical fields, right? And so I went into football where your main aim, as a, and I was a defensive player, is to kill the other person. And I took it very seriously. I was good at it. I was very vicious and I was very violent. I got the marks, the bones and joints and bruises and things to prove it. What this is, this is physical warfare. And so this is what, this is what I would say. One of the toughest physical battles that I ever went through was two a days at Iowa. And why, the reason I say that is because you, I'm, I'm snatched out of my home environment, which is Orlando, around all black people in the hood, and Mercy Drive and Ivy Lane. You bring me to Iowa City, right? And you throw me into a farm culture, right? Where a lot of the kids are farmers. But one thing about big white farmers is they know how to work, right? And so 
You got an eighteen year old kid. You could barely well be going up against a twenty five year old man. I remember time I went against uh, offensive linemen so strong that they literally broke my helmet. Right, and then you in a situation where all you do is breathe, sleep, eat, train football. You don't socialize. You barely even sleep. You train in twice a day. If you're not out on the field, you in the weight room. You up at five in the morning. You getting hit, either you hit or you get hit. You getting cussed out over and over. Even if you do it right, you might get cussed out because you didn't do it right enough, and and you don't know what the hell is going on. And at some point, you sit there and think, what in the hell am I doing here, right? So I guess this is mental and physical warfare going on here. You sore, you tired, you beat down. You're not the biggest, strongest person no more. Yeah, you're not so big and bad because there's 20 other big, bad people trying to bust your face in. It's a beautiful thing. It could make you be from a boy to a man. And so again, when all of this set in, because I said I got a Division One scholarship to a Big Ten school, I thought it was such a great thing. When all of the hell and torments set in, I called my mom. I said, and I was complaining. I said, Ma, they won't even, this, this was a lie. I just wanted to see what she was going to say. I said, Ma, they won't even let us come home for Thanksgiving. And I said, all the other kids are gone. The campus is going to be empty. And they just... They treating us like slaves. I don't, I don't, I don't know if this is cut out for me. And again, that warrior black woman with the spirit of Empress and Zika said, "Well, you better suck it up. You chose to go up there. You gonna finish." <laughs> oh man, that's the warrior woman, right? Because the the men in my life, when I said how rough it is up here. And maybe I'm not getting a fair shot and it's brutal. They said, well, maybe you could come back to another cottage closer to home. Or maybe you would have it better. Sh shut the hell up. Right? Finish what you started. That's what my mom said. Nah, I don't know why she got more strength than the men I knew, but I keep talking about the black woman. So um, I've had some experiences. I, I signed up to fight in a cage just to just to see how it was there. And that's a stressful situation when you're gonna step into an octagon and you know somebody's trying to punch you in the face and either you punch them or you get punched too, but they might take you down, you never know. So that was a good uh, learning experience for me. And then I signed up to do a, a amateur boxing match. They put me in a, there with a guy who was six foot five and young. I was too old to be doing that. Uh, but, but it was a good learning experience to see what you would do under pressure. Pressure is a big part of war. What do you do under, we can all talk this talk now, but when you're surrounded, when you're tired, when you're fatigued and you don't know what to do, then what happens? That's when we know who's a warrior, right? And going into these courtrooms every day, and this criminal injustice system in America, with 95% of 98% of my clients being black, it's war. It's war. To be getting clients, protecting my clients' freedom, keeping them from being uh, unjustly shipped into the prison industrial complex, having to uh, master the rules and the, and the regulations and the negotiations and the different aspects of this criminal injustice system, that's mental and intellectual war every day. So those are just some of the, I've never went to Afghanistan and fought in the war, I don't want to. But these are the aspects of combat, be physical, intellectual, that I've been involved in and had to compete, and it was do or die. Because if I couldn't pass the bar, then I'm in all this debt for nothing, and 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 then I'm stuck like hell. I can't practice law. What the hell did I go to law school for three years? This is mental. You got to be mentally prepared for such a battle. A lot of uh, every law school has a psychologist because a lot of students break. Here, yeah, law school can break you. So. So these are the things that are the experiences that I've had to help me come up with these rules. Now, the number one thing, if you're going to build a young black African centered warrior, the number one thing you're going to have to give him is not a gun, it's not a weight room, it's not a boxing glove. You're going to have to give this young male knowledge of self. 
If he doesn't have this, he might be a mercenary. He might be a hired killer, but he's not a warrior. He's not a soldier, right? He has to know who he is. Now me, this is not anybody else's definition but mine. This is what I break down knowledge of self into. I break down knowledge of self into number one, a knowledge of God. I know black people are spiritual from day one. If you find a black atheist, you just found a dark-skinned European. Black people are spiritual from day one. Go back to Ethiopia, where we set up the first spiritual systems. Okay? Everything that we did was based on God, even the pyramids and eternal life. Right? So, faith is going to be crucial for a warrior. We are not atheists. We are not these other people. If this boy is going to know himself, he's going to have to know God because the Bible says we are all gods. How are you going to know yourself if you don't know God if you are a God? Right? Okay. So we got that down. You got to have God and you got to have faith. And just like when David was going up against Goliath, or when Empress and Zinga was going up against the Portuguese, or when Yar Sante, well, I'm naming a lot of women soldiers, you know what I'm saying? Okay, well, when Nat Turner was leading his revolution, he had to have faith. Because if you don't have any faith and you just look at this for what you physically see, it's no need to even fight. We already lost. It's over. It's over, okay? I'm not going to answer any questions that aren't relevant to this subject. All right, so number one, we're talking about building African-centered warriors. If your, if your uh, question doesn't have anything to do with that, then I'm not going to answer it. Okay, so knowledge of self, knowledge of God, knowledge of history. When you go to military school, it's crazy that the mili the, the, our soldiers are taught so much history. But you have to know not only the history of warfare, but history of the world and the different circumstances and components that went into a war. But for a black warrior, a young African warrior, he's got to know his history. Because if he goes with what he's told today, that the blacks are just thugs, hoes, baby mamas, baby daddies, pimp, pimps, criminals, then there's nothing worth fighting for. You got to know, he's got to know where he came from. He got to know what we did when we were African. He's got to know the, what they did against us to bring us here. He's got to know God and he's got to know his history, right? And he's got to know his ancestors because you get strength from your ancestors. If somebody came and told me you could make a magnificent impact in devastating this prison industrial complex and uniting black people and waking them up and moving us toward independence, in this day and age, you probably wouldn't even believe it because black people care more about going to the club than independence. Well, no, not all black people. A lot of black people care more about popping mollies. Yeah, now that's a question I'll answer. Do you have any favorite African warriors? I was thinking about that before I came on the air. Oddly enough, I'm aiming this at the black male. But I would have to say that the greatest of the African warriors was Empress Nzinga. Now, everybody can argue, argue Shaka Zulu, and everybody can argue Hannibal Barker. But Empress Nzinga didn't get beat <laughs> for 40 damn years. All right? And this, and, and this wasn't just physical warfare. She was psychological warfare. They, some people talking about Tupac Machiavelli faked his death. Empress and Zinga been faked that death and came back and killed more Europeans. So, if I had to pick one in Africa, I had to go with Empress and Zinga. Now, I love what Shaka Zulu did by uniting all these different tribes, instituting a war culture, building a powerful nation that fought the British, but Shaka never actually fought the British. The, now, the war machine that he built fought the British, but if I was going to have to come over to this hemisphere... I'm really stuck between Nat Turner and Dessaline, right? I'm, 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 I'm stuck between those two. It's a toss-up, and that's like making me choose between an AK and a Scar. How the hell am I going to choose? 
That's that making me choose between a good Kalishnikov and a Scar 17. Right? Ah, do I have to pick one? Well, I'm black, so I can have both. All right, here we go. Now, those somebody asked me a question about my favorite African soldiers. I'm from Africa. This is Miss Galena. Came to America as a kid. The first thing I noticed is how differently I was treated for being black. It was a bit culture shock. Welcome to America. <laughs> that's how they get down over here. That, that's how they get down over here. All right. Now, here we go. I went to God. I went to history. And you got to know the ancestors. That falls in with history. Now, when I say God, when I say faith, when I say eternal life, if you're going to be a soldier, yo, man, this is, this is not a hard pill to swallow. And none of us are trying to die. I got two little babies. I don't want to die soon. But if you're going to be a soldier, if you're going to be a warrior, your main aim cannot be to live a long, prosperous life. Now, do I want to live a long, prosperous life? Absolutely. I want to live to be 150 and still be able to bench press and see my kids, kids, and kids, kids, kids. Yes, I want that. That will be phenomenal. But as a soldier, right, this is why you got to be in touch with God. Because you got to know there's another life after this. This isn't the only life. Right? You cannot be over obsessed with living a long life. Because if you're scared to die, if you worry about dying, you got to go. You got to go now. How in the hell are you going to... Now, I'm not saying all of our soldiers die early. Because some people try to say, you're not a real black leader if you didn't die soon. That's a damn lie. Harriet Tubman didn't die soon. And she didn't die early. Robert F. Williams lived old age. Elijah Muhammad lived old age. But, 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 so you just say Martin and Malcolm and Mary Evans got killed. You don't have to get killed. But what I'm saying is you got to be okay with it. How about that? There's got to be things more important to you than living a long life, a prosperous life. Because if that's your main aim to live a long time and make a lot of money, you'll be the next Jesse Jackson. <laughs> Hell, you'll be the next Jesse Lee Peterson. You'll be the next Al Sharpton. You'll be the next Cornell West. Yeah. Yeah. So that that can't be your main thing. And, and what's this? Okay. Now I'm going to give this to you and I'm going to give this to you directly. If you're going to be a warrior, uh, George Jackson said that patience, patience is a virtue, uh, too, but too much, patience, too much patience becomes cowardice. Right? Something along those lines. As a warrior, and I never advise anybody to do anything illegal, but as a warrior, there's got to be a line. There's got to be a point where you push the nuclear button. What that mean? There's some things that you can't accept and they're not going to do to you. Right? They're not going to do this to my family. They're not going to do this to me. And if it is done... I will kill for it. Well, what do you mean by that, Vern? No, I'm not talking about going off and doing random illegal acts of violence. I'm just saying that I and many warriors that I know would not set up a GoFundMe and tell everybody to be calm and quiet. If Trayvon Martin was my son. <laughs> see, the, see when Barack Obama gave that damn speech talking about Trayvon Martin looked like me? S Trayvon Martin did not look like you. Trayvon Martin looked like his daddy. But all I'm saying is that if there's no line that you won't allow them to cross, then they're going to cross every line. Right? So it's got to be a point where you say, you know what? This is where all warriors have a point. Not only, and I'm not saying you have a point where you just die. I'm talking about you have a point where you fight. Die or not. Right? You got to have that point. Because if they recognize that as a people we don't have that point, they're going to keep pressing every button and crossing every line. Okay? Warriors got to have a damn line. I have a line. 
and I don't mind. <laughs> I have to lie, and I don't mind. All right, all right. So I'm gonna start with God, history, ancestors, knowledge of self, faith. Next, what is, what we're gonna have to give these young black males is a moral code of right and wrong, and this is gonna go back to the last, uh, to the last one in a way, but. Warriors, soldiers, even the, one thing I noticed about this is that the white soldiers, the, the, the European American soldiers in their army, they have a code. And they have a code, they have a code where certain things are accepted and certain things aren't, right? It's important that we have a moral code because this is why. When you have a moral code, you can recognize right from wrong. You can recognize justice and injustice. You can recognize how to conduct yourself. And you could recognize how another person is supposed to conduct themselves in relation to you and your family. Right? And when that person violates the code, see, it's a G code. It's a street code. We got to have a warrior code. Because when that person crosses that line, you have to be able to say, that's a violation. And not only is a violation, what level of violation? Because every violation ain't worth killing somebody. Do you see? Right? If I'm in the store and a dude look at my wife and he didn't notice I was there or something, yeah, that's worth me saying, whoa, uh, just, you know, stepping into the, into the picture. But that's not worth me killing nobody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But when you, if you don't have a moral code that... And with levels to this thing, you can't evaluate. Some of our boys think stepping on their shoes is a level 10 violation. We're deaf. Whoa, that's a messed up code, big fella. I think where Michael Jordan should be a level 10, Mike, a level 10 violation. But anyway, we got to have an understanding of what's right and what's wrong. And that'll give us a better grip on what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. See, the Bible says to turn the other cheek. And in Many situations, that's right. When you're dealing with your brother and your brother has committed an offense, let's say he owes you $40 and he only bought 30 Accept that offense. Don't beat the hell out of him and post it on Instagram. Do you see what I'm saying? Can you let that go? See, this is the true meaning of turning the other cheek. But if somebody's coming to blow, away, blow you away, or to kill or rape, rape your wife, you don't turn the other cheek. You just pull the damn trigger. Do you see? It's levels to this. But if you don't have no moral code, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't understand that it's levels, then you won't, you won't fully grasp uh, when it's time to do what it's time to do. So everybody got to have a moral code, and if we have a moral code, we can have more unity. I'm not a big unity person. I don't believe in black unity. I believe in black separation. I don't believe black people can unify with all black people. I can't unify with Condoleezza Rice or Clarence Thomas. I can't and I won't unify with D. Ray McKesson. I cannot unify with young jock wearing dresses. Some of these dudes ain't even men. But if we had a code, right? If we had a code that we would go by, men handle this this way. If I have a problem with you, I come talk to you to your face. Right? If we have a code, then we could have more unity. But right now, I don't want unity. I want the real soldiers. Everybody else can go to hell. Right? Everybody else can go to hell. Now, let's move on. Moral code worth dying for. Now, this one thing I wanted to tell the black man that we have to put in our Boys, because I think we lost track of this somewhere along the way. A black man ought to value his woman, his wife, not only that, his mother and daughters, more than he values his Michael Jordan shoes. But well, why do I say that? This is why I say that. I've seen black men who will go out and kill another black man because he stepped on his Michael Jordan shoes or because he dissed him. But you would let some other person come up and slap the taste out your wife and not do a damn thing. But wait a minute. That's a little bit uh, off kilt, right? 
You don't, you value your reputation, my rep, my street cred, more than you value your own woman. That's pretty sick, right? Or your, you value your Michael Joe. I've literally seen dudes say he stepped on my shoe. It got to the point where I would be in the club. If I make a mistake and step on somebody's shoe, I'm saying, my bad, bro. And then the old, this, this is what I noticed. If I'm around older people, they maybe be uh, 35 and up. You step on their shoe and apologize. They be like, man, it's all right. I ain't not worry about that. They, they, they surprise you so apologetic. You step on that jitterbug shoe, you got to hope he ain't going out to his car to get his gun. Right? But we ought to value our women more than we value our Michael Jordan shoes. But we'll, I'm going to move on from that. Nah. Now, I'm a, th this is something I've learned. When you get, this is something I've learned that all our warriors must have. Our warriors must have a discipline code. That they must know how to live by a regimen. What does that mean? When you're getting ready for a battle, when you're getting ready to take on any enormous task, the best way to accomplish this task is to organize your whole life in the most constructive way towards accomplishing that, ta accomplishing that task. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. When I was getting ready to take the bar, and it was a lot of pressure on me because a lot of people in my neighborhood, they thought I would be going to prison, not being ready to be a lawyer to keep people out of prison. So it was a lot of pressure. So when I'm going up against this enormous task, I organized my entire life to give me the maximum chance at uh, success. Well, how does that look? There was no partying or drinking at that time. Well, only one day a week I was allowed to drink, and that was maybe on Sunday. There was no partying. There was no late nights. I was in the bed by 9.30, and I was up by 5 a.m. I was studying between 8 and 10 hours every day, except that one off day, because everybody, even God, had to have a day off. I was studying between 8 and 10 hours a day, right? I would eat twice a day, uh, particular meals that, that were healthy. I was in the best shape of my life, uh, coincidentally, back then, because everything was so structured. And... I was writing essays, I was reading out lines, I was doing practice tests, I was going to my bar, I was doing everything that I could do for two months straight. Forget the two months before that, forget two months after that. This is called a regimen, right? It's the same thing that great fighters do when they get ready to go into a huge fight. Everything else shuts down, right? The way I eat, the way I sleep, the way I pray, the way I meditate, everything is geared toward this goal. And if black people could adopt just some of these principles, because you can't live your whole life in training camp mode, but you can live your whole life with a regimen and with discipline, right? As a warrior, you're going to have to. I'm working on it this time. I eat this. I don't eat that. These little components of discipline that will help you to be the best warrior you can be. So when you have a huge task, whether it be intellectual or physical, our young men have to learn to apply military discipline and, 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 and a regimented lifestyle. A lot of them don't have that now. They wake up when they get ready. They eat what they want. They come home when they get ready. They wear what they want. They talk how they want. That's not discipline. That's not regimented living, right? Even even when I'm, since the hurricane, I've been kind of kicking back, uh, enjoying life and taking it easy. But even then, I'm going to get me a workout in. I'm going to get me some prayer in. I'm going to get me some Bible study in. I'm going to get me some reading in. I'm going to go to the mosque and be around the brothers there. I'm going to do things that are going to empower me and keep me going spiritually, mentally, and physically, even when I'm relaxing. And that's what a warrior has to do because this thing can get draining. When they're writing, 
when they write an article saying that the black man is the white man of the black community, they on your ass. You better, even if you chilling for a minute, you better be ready, right? So, discipline. You got to teach the young man that. Next. Okay. And this is something that a lot of people don't get. They tell us that we have to have eight hours of sleep. They tell us that if we lift too hard in the weight room, that we will overtrain. They tell us that no one could be expected to work 12 hours a day or seven days a week. These things are abnormal. Well, a warrior, when you get into a war or into war mode, you throw all those rules out the damn window. Right? Maybe it is good to get eight hours of sleep. I don't know. But I know if I'm in a predicament like I once was, I had a criminal trial coming up in just a couple of days. But I was also finishing my second book and I had given myself a deadline to get it done and get it released. I wanted to have it out on the first day of Black History Month. Who knew that I would have a trial with a client facing 30 years the same week the book was supposed to come out. So when when I'm going into trial mode to write cross-examination questions and make sure I don't went through these depots and I'm ready to destroy the witnesses on the other side, then I also got a book that I'm trying to proofread, make sure it's how it's supposed to be because if it's one typo, they'll come out the black man hard. So I couldn't push one to the back burner. Normally, my work would come first as a lawyer, but that book had to be done. I had I had told the people it was coming out. And so, to hell with the eight hours of sleep. To hell with the you can't work too many hours a day. To hell with all the this is uncomfortable. You have to go into a mode where you get this done. And that's an intellectual war and competition as well as physical. Hell, to, you can be tired tomorrow and you can rest another day. But a real warrior is going to have a zone that he can go into where he disregards what's comfortable. Hell, I don't like to get up and drive out of town to go do court dates and all this stuff. But who gives a damn? You have daughters. So you have to make money. So get the hell up and go. Better drink your Mountain Dew and get moving. Do you see what I'm saying? Real warriors can disregard what's comfortable what's feeling good for what has to get done. Now, do I ever want to be writing a book and getting ready for trial again at the same time? No. Please, God, let, if I write another book, uh, I have another trial with a person that can be enough for 30 years coming up. Can I have them on separate weeks? Please, God. But if God says no, this time you're going to have two trials coming up and two books, guess what? I just got to do it. Okay? If you're not willing to suffer, you're not willing to win. And that's in physical combat. And, 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 and this is the thing. When you lift, I don't know how many of you lift weights, but I lift weights with a passion. When you lift weights, you're going to get to a point where that workout was easy. And the only time you're going to go to the next level is to push your body past fatigue. What does that mean? When your muscles are sore and you feel the pain and you feel the burning and you're ready to put the bar down and you say, hell no, let me get a couple more reps. Let's go to another level, right? Forget what's, oh yeah, it hurts. Shut the hell up. It burns, I know. But do you want to go to another level or do you want to stay the same? That's how it is with combat. If you get tired and drop your hands in a boxing match, you're going to get knocked the hell out. So even if your arms and hands are tired, you better keep them up. Unless you Floyd Mayweather, <laughs> they can't hit you. It ain't that many Floyd Mayweathers walking around here. Hell, that's what happened to Conor McGregor. He got tired. He got uncomfortable. He wasn't willing to go uh, past his comfort zone. And Floyd Mayweather hit his ass five or ten times. And he was on the he was on the rope, looking like a damn fish about to get gutted. Yeah, war is not about being comfortable. All right, so our young men have to know that. Number five, warriors have to study war. Do you see? America, I believe it's this college called Liberty. 
And then you got West Point, and you got all these different uh, academies. They teach and they study war. There's a science to war. That's why I got this book. Where's that book, The Art of War? It's a, hundreds of books around here. Our boys should study war. Do you know why the Europeans like to take their kids to paintball activities and to uh, laser tag? And they take them to the gun range and they sign them up for mixed martial arts and they sign them up for wrestling and boxing is because they're studying all components of war. And if you know you are warlike people, then you better know war. But if you know you are people under attack, shouldn't you want to know even more about war? Right? Shouldn't you want to know even more about war? So, I believe, and I'm, I'm going to have to uh, restart the Instagram in a second. I believe we should study war, and not only study it, we have to glorify war. One second. Let me start Instagram back up. It only gives you a certain time each time. Okay. Let me let them get back in. Let me let them come back in. Mm -hmm. I say that I believe, and now I know, we not only have to study war, but we have to glorify war. That may be hard for African to say because Africans are peaceful people. But what I'm saying is this. At this time, the people who we live amongst who are hostile to us, they glorify war. The When they committed genocide upon the Indians, they made movies about it. What they did in the world wars, they glorify in documentaries and films. Their great generals and war leaders, they love them. George Washington and Andrew Jackson and all these vicious killers, Christopher Columbus? That's the most sadistic, damn killing, rapist, devil, devil dog you could ever think of. They gave him a holiday. Because they understand the value of war. Right? War is important. We, we, should, we should glorify our warriors. That's why I have, if, I don't know if y'all can see it, I have Empress and Zinga, Shaka Zulu, and Fred Hampton right here on this wall behind me. Why would you not Glorify your warriors. When the when the hyenas come to take the female lions' food, and those big male lions with the black man come and crush those hyenas, don't you think those female lions are telling those little boys? Now, when you get a few years older, that's how you kill hyenas. They're doing a great job. That's how you do it, right? But we tell our people. No, nah, don't, don't, don't fight for black people. Don't stand up for black people because you'll get killed. Yeah, hell no, you better glorify your warriors. Just like they do. And war. Fighting is good. Now, I keep seeing all the, I just saw a video the other day. And I reposted it, man. There was a tall, gay-looking European male. And he had on some very, very extremely tight pants. He walked up to a sister in front of two black teenage males called the sister a fucking bitch and punched her right in her face. And the two young black males didn't do a damn thing. Right? Didn't do a damn thing. Didn't even say nothing. Just looking at him like, <laughs> okay, all right. I happen to know some young black males in an organization that I'm a part of. Had this happened in front of them, had this European done this to that sister in front of them, I can wholeheartedly guarantee that that European would have been beaten. <laughs> I was, I, I remember when they, uh, they were talking about this movie, The Passion of Christ, 
they made Jesus white. They always do. And and it, it really angered me. But they beat him really bad. I remember they said they beat him beyond recognition. Okay. Well, if this European male had did that in front of one of my BPM teenage soldiers, I guarantee they would have beat him beyond recognition. How about that? How about that? Law, lawful defense of others. Did you guys know that in Florida, and you would have to check your particular, uh, you have to check your particular state. Did you, you guys know that there's not only defense of self, but there's defense of others. So go up and read the guidelines for when self-defense is lawful. You don't heard all that about the standing ground, but a part of every one of these self-defense laws is not only defense of self, but defense of others and defense of property, defense of the home. So go out and read all those statutes because when that devil attack that sister okay that's probably they, one of their cousins or sisters I don't know what it, what it, what, what it is when that devil attacked their sister I'm pretty sure that triggered defense of others and then that's when you go ahead and handle your business as Dr. Khaled Muhammad would say in lawful self defense <laughs> lawful constitutional alright you know that now nah. What's the next step we got on here? You have to, this is the next step. See, most of these things about the warrior are all uh, related to mental and intellectual. You notice I haven't talked about guns and 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 and, 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 and um, box beating people. I haven't talked to, we don't talk more about the mental. Because if the soldier ain't right spiritually and mentally, he's not a soldier, he's just a mercenary. Right? You kill anybody for any reason. He don't know what the hell going on. So all these things are mental. So the next thing you have to do is know your enemy. And you have to break that down. You have to know who your enemy is. And then know your enemy. Right now, I don't think we know who our enemies are. And so I'm going to give you a list. And this is not an exclusive list, but I'm going to start off. Then I'll give you a definition at the end to uh, help you know more. The enemies of the black race today in America include, but are not limited to, feminists, major enemies to the black family, fluids, people who are saying that there's no genders and gender norms should be destroyed and a man can wear a dress and a woman can be a man and he can have, I call those fluid, gender fluidity, enemies, okay, so we got feminists, Feminists, fluidists, white supremacists, enemies. Okay, y'all, y'all already know the people in Charlottesville was your enemy. Okay, uh, the alt right, that's you already know that. It's not a big surprise. But you know who else is your enemy? Liberals. Yeah, Hillary Clinton, enormous enemy. Bill Clinton, the whole Clinton Foundation, Barack Hussein Obama, and I just wish Michelle wasn't a part of this. Was that's a that's a beautiful black woman, but. Michelle Obama, Serena Williams, integrationists, enemies. Okay, now, you want me to give you an umbrella definition of who your enemies are? Anyone who's against just reparations. What do I mean by just reparations? Uh, in constitutional law, if the government takes your pro property, they can do it under eminent domain and all these different things, but if they take your property... They have to give you just compensation, fair compensation, right? They have to compensate you in a way adequate, you know, and at least commensurate with what they took. Well, when we talk about reparations, it has to be just. Don't just say, okay, you're the, you're the descendant of people who we bought here enslaved. We're going to give you an apology of Martin Luther King Day and some food stamps. And that's your hell no. We, we need to have just reparations, right? Something that's going to put us back into economic and political um, parity and competition so we can go be independent. So make sure you understand what I'm saying about reparations. Here's your enemy. Anybody who is against just reparations and nationhood for blacks in America, if they don't want us to be compensated for what our ancestors went through, and if they don't want us to have our own independent political and, and economic systems and our own place, 
our own, if they don't want us to have our own, they're your enemy. I don't care what else they say. Well, I like black people. I have a black girlfriend. I I I like fried chicken and I can do the name name. I don't care. If you don't want me to have reparations, well, it costs too much. I don't give a damn. Do you know how much it costs my ancestors? It costs them their lives. Right? If they don't want us to have reparations, if, if me, anybody, and you say, should blacks be justly compensated for the torture, pain, labor contributions, uh, inventions that they took from us, uh, spiritual systems that they destroyed, all the suffering in the Middle Passage, should we be compensated today for what our ancestors went through and what the ramifications of that are? If they say they're not with it, that's your enemy. I don't care if he's an Arab, a white, a gay, a Jew, a liberal, progressive. I don't care if he's an alt-right, a Donald Trump, a Rush Limbaugh, Barack Hussein Obama. If they are against just reparations, enemy. If they are against nationhood, enemy. So, nah. Okay, I told you you have to know who your enemy is. I just helped you out with that. I just helped you out. Now, now that you know who your enemy is, you have to know your enemy. Because just because I know Black Lives Matter is my enemy, I need to know all about that enemy. Where do they get their money? Who are the main people that they're targeting? How do they target these people? What attacks are they going to use against the people that stand up against them? How long have they been in existence? How can they be defeated? Who started this organization? Who's funded? These, you got to know your enemy. One second. I got to get Facebook going again. What's going on here? Got to get Facebook back going here. One second, folks. <laughs> It should be, it should be good to go. All right. So you got to know all about your enemy. And I'm going to give you another one. What Black Lives Matter is doing is convincing black people that there's no need for the masculine feminine balance, which our ancestors told us about way back then. They're trying to tell us you can let that go. We can, we can take out the uh, the womb, the ovaries from the unk, and put another phallus. <laughs> That's what they're trying to tell us now. Or you could take out the phallus and put another another womb. That would be more like an eight. They want to destroy the structure that we understand as the black family. And anyone who goes against it, first they're going to call you a homophobic, hyper-masculine. Right? They're going to call you a homophobic, hyper-masculine, old-fashioned, you're discriminating. And then the next thing they're going to do is say, you're a gay person yourself. Right? If you stand against the Black Lives Matter movement, and if you stand against, because it's really the Gay Lives Matter, it's the LGBT movement. Well, I forgot the Q. LGBTQ movement. And if they want to be that movement, they should have just said it. LGBTQ Lives Matter. But why are they going to hide it underneath Black Lives Matter? But um, this is what they're going to do. Everybody who stands against it, like Irritated Jenny, Umar Johnson, uh, Bob Baruti, all the real, real men and women that we have, man, it's not that many, right? But anybody who says, no, I think the black man, no, no, I know the black man ought to be with the black woman, building families and raising black kids. Anybody who says that, they're going to say, well, you're hyper-masculine, you're homophobic, you are you're, you're old-fashioned, you're discriminating against the LGBT, you all of these things, right? And if that they go, doesn't work, then they're going to say, well, you must be gay yourself, <laughs> then, right? You got to know your enemy. This is what they're going to do. This is what they're going to do. So you got to know who your enemy is and then know your enemy. I don't know what's next after Black Lives Matter because this is a devilish catastrophe. Shit, I don't know how. Well, I guess, I guess if it can get worse than Margaret Sanger and the eugenics movement, it could get worse than Black Lives Matter. But damn, 
how bad can it get? You got black women saying they don't want a black man. They don't want to be in no marriage. What the hell? That's repressive. What? How is it having somebody that's going to protect you, have your back, help you raise the kids, make sure the kids do what you tell them? How is teamwork repressive? If I ever hear a black man say he don't want no black wife or no black woman, I know to get the hell away from him. He's a fool. But that's what they're doing. So I had to go ahead and give you that. Nah, know, your en know who your enemy is and then know your enemy. Nah, I'm going to step number seven. Now we're going to get to the physical part. Everything else has been basically mental and intellectual and getting your ideology and your mind frame right. Your approach to life, your approach to thinking, your approach to God, getting all that right. Now, the next thing you're going to have to do is uh, physical self-development. You cannot be a fat, overweight, obese, uh, sugar diabetes, high cholesterol, falling, can't run two miles, warrior. It's not going to work. Pacemaker, warrior. It's not going to work. Stomach so big, you can't even put on a bulletproof vest. It's not going to work. You got to run down the street and get back to say to the family, you die on the way down. It's not going to work. Right? It's a physical part to this now. It's not all physical, but there is a physical part. You're supposed to be a warrior. He come up and cuss your wife out and slap her in the face. You don't even know how to throw a punch. You punch it like this. You can't be a warrior, Okay? There's a training part to this. There is a physical component to this, and it's important. Just like they punched that sister in the face, and them little weak behind kids didn't even know what to do. You can't be a warrior, right? Let's get physical now. It's okay. It's okay. Let's talk about physicality. They're training their kids in mixed martial arts right now to beat the hell out of your kid, choke them out. I'm training my kids how to get out of a choke and do a reversal. <laughs> how about that? Not even let them get you in the choke, Okay. So our eating, these are the things that, that are going to allow you to flourish physically. I know sometimes I'm really serious about my fitness, right? Not all the time, I can't lie. Sometimes I like fries. But sometimes I get really serious. And when you're serious about your physical development, your eating is going to change. Your eating is going to change. You can't be eating McDonald's all the time talking about you a warrior. Drinking sodas every day talking about you a warrior. How you gonna be a warrior? You about to die. The day ain't gonna have to kill you, right? Sleep. Your body rebuilds itself with sleep. You don't always need to get the eight hours every day like they tell you, but at some point you need rest and you need recuperation, right? And training. How you going to be a warrior? You can't even do a push-up. You can't do a pull-up. You fat as hell. No, that's not going to work, big fella. You weak as hell. I've never seen a warrior like that. Shaka Zulu had intense physical training regiments throughout the whole nation. But they had to run certain miles a day. They had to have combat training. How in the hell are you a warrior? You don't even know how to shoot a gun. Right? This baby right here, nah, we, was at, we were at the guard range today, right? You don't know how to load a magazine. You don't know trigger discipline. You done shot yourself. You're a warrior and you don't train? Come on now. Come on now. You're going to you're gonna have to have the physical component now because it could happen. The only time, the only time I ever had to actually uh, draw one of my weapons in self-defense was when I was surrounded by four white supremacists outside of a gym that I was lifting weights at. And I knew they wanted to kill me. And I knew if I would have, I could beat down one or two of them, but I knew it. Four of them, one of them was probably going to stab me or do something. So I said, okay, big fella, I don't got this AK for nothing. <laughs> do you see? But if you're scared as hell, you don't even know how to hold an AK, you don't know what to do, they're, 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 you're a dead man walking. Oh, they seen that black AK-47, you would have thought they seen that Turner the way they got the hell out of there. But uh, the physical component is true. So 
And then there's more than one component to that because you can't just be lifting weights or you can't just be lift doing cardio or you can't just be doing gun training because that's my big brother boat right said earlier today what you gonna do when you run out of bullets Ooh, woo. i wish we didn't even have to have no bullets and we could do everything like this but you know we can't but uh you're gonna have to get those different components if you train a young black warrior, I would have him in mixed martial arts. I would have him learning grappling, submissions, striking. I would have him running. I, this is what we do at BPM. And I got one of the most, for, I got, matter of fact, I got three. I got four. I got four of the most magnificent youth soldiers in the world. I'll put them up against anybody. I'm not gonna give you their names. But I'm just going to tell you, I've watched these guys develop. And if, if it's a shooting contest, a wrestling match, a boxing match, listen, man, we, I'm telling you, bring your, if you think your son's tough, or if your son thinks he's tougher than he really is, bring him to BPM, and we will expose him to himself. Right? Okay. The physical component is true. Now you got to do preparation. Just because you trained and you're ready to go, do you have the tools necessary to engage in combat or to survive, right? Do you have weapons? Do you have body armor? Do you have a generator? Do you have water? Do you know how to uh, get food? Do you know how to preserve food? Do you know how to store water? These are things that we need to, this is called, I put this under the preparation component. We need to teach our boys this. There was a time when black boys knew how to go catch a fish or hunt and clean what they killed to cook it. They don't know that anymore. That's why they always have to, whenever there's an extreme emergency, they have to bust in the store. Which I'm not talking down on that because if I was hungry, I'd bust in that too. But what I'm saying is that there was a time when we were growing our own gardens, catching our fish, uh, shooting our own uh, game. There was a time. And some of us still are, but not very many. And so, in preparation, can you do those things if you had to go back to them? We just had a hurricane. Boy, look at here. I had, to, I had to consider what I was willing to do and not to do. Do you see what I'm saying? And so, the other thing is organizing. It's good for you to be trained, prepared, and ready. But it's even better if your whole block is. Do you see? your whole neighborhood is, right? Because if you train and prepare and ready, but all of your neighbors are not, and they desperate as hell, you're going to end up having to kill them because they're going to come to take what you got in, a, in an emergency situation. So are we organizing our people? It can't just stop on social media. We have to get out, and we got to get our people together, the ones that we can reach. Now, the ones that don't want to be reached, let them die. But there are people out here that are waiting for something conscious and, 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 and forward thinking to come out and pull them in. We have to have enough guts to go up and say, hey, man, come check this out. That's why I wear BPM wherever I go. What's BPM? A community empowerment organization. Do you care about the black community? Then come out to one of our meetings. We'll be meeting at this location. Don't ask me what's BPM. You'll find yourself at a meeting with some of the most serious black people in the whole city in the next two days if you ask that question. Right? So we got to organize. And all of these things that I told you that we need to teach our youth, none of them matter unless we can make it relevant to our youth, right? We can't be so conscious in the church they would call this holier than thou. You're so holy that you know earthly good. The brother come up to you and ask you what he's supposed to do when he's married and he see all these other beautiful half-naked women walking around and you say, brother, you shouldn't even be seeing those women. You should be so holy that you don't even see. We got to still be able to connect with our youth. And we might not listen to Lil Uzi Vert, but they do. And we might not 
know what it means to pop a molly, I'm sweating, but they do. And so all of these things that we teach them, we got to be able to make it relevant to them. And that's one of the reasons that BPM has been so successful. So I always say the number one thing to do to make sure you get it through to these youth is start early. If you get them while they five, six, seven, eight, they're in. You don't got to worry about reaching back out. They're, they're in. Right? Be consistent. Always be consistent with our youth. Practice what you preach. They can see that. And make it a spiritual mandate. And BPM, every black man is, well, every one of our black males is expected to marry a black woman, produce and provide for and protect the black family. God said do it. What did he say? Well, I don't know how they say it in the Quran, or I don't know how they say it in um, other books, but in the in the Bible, the one the, the, the that I know best, it says when a man finds a wife, uh oh, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> it says when a man finds a wife, well, what? Well, maybe they could find a way to argue with that one. What it says, be fruitful and multiply. Now, do you think Bayard Rustin and his boyfriend were able to multiply? Oh, okay. Uh, we make it a spiritual mandate that you do this. Because as I said back at the beginning, black people are spiritual, right? That's why even the biggest, baddest black thug, when he get ready to go to court, he turned back to that Bible. <laughs> he, he said, man, I've been praying. He might have been out there thugging and robbing for 19 years, but he still knows there's a God, right? So we have to make this a spiritual mandate. There's no other option than to be a warrior, it's no other option than to be a husband. It's no other option than to be a scholar. See, in BPM, we don't create warriors. We create warrior scholars or scholar warriors. You gotta be both. But today we were just talking about the warrior component. We make it a spiritual mandate. So these are the things that I believe all of our youth have to know if they're gonna be warriors. I know we need warriors. Did you see Charlottesville? Everybody they tear down the statue, that could happen. And I was just listening to Tariq Nasheed. He played a clip by Richard Spencer, the head of the alt-right. And Richard Spencer, right, the head of the alt-right, which is the new Klan, he said that if uh, white people are going to survive on the earth, they are going to have to get mean and they are going to have to get nasty. But wait a minute. You already lynched Sandra Bland. You already shot Rakeel Boyd, Trayvon Martin, Jordan Davis. You already poisoned all of Flint, Michigan. You already been going across the country lynching our people. They find them in trees. No, they're calling it suicide. You already had the white cop out there in Oklahoma raping all the black women. You already got Philando Castillo. You already got uh, Oscar Grant. You already got Sean Bell. Ain't this mean enough? What the hell else do you have planned? Shit. There's more? <laughs> do you see? You got more plans? Damn. So, um, if you don't understand that we need words when the white supremacists just said they got to get mean and nasty, I thought they was already mean and nasty. When they shot the boy on Facebook, that's not the boy, the man on Facebook Live, in front of his woman and his child, there's more. Okay, if there's more, then you know we got to have warriors. So, that's all I got uh, for tonight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to upload this. Go to my Facebook, uh, not Facebook, but uh, YouTube, uh, search Attorney Awesome BPM. I have most of the previous discussions up there. You can watch them again on YouTube. You can subscribe. You can share them. And you can also donate to our BPM movements, tax deductible, uh, building powerful minds. We have our, it's all tax deductible. Just Google building powerful minds and it'll come up. And uh, yeah, so 
We've had our chance to talk. It's Thursday night. What are you going to do between here and next Thursday to bring forth black liberation and independence? It's all about independence unless you're a beta wrestling fan. And BPM is not. All right. Y'all have a good one.